Okay, welcome back to Economics. This is Dr. Kling. Today's topic is a continuation of this issue of consumer utility. We talk about more consumer trade-offs. So last time we talked about any two goods, I'll just call them X and Y, when we drew what are called indifference curves, meaning that you would have the same level of utility anywhere along these curves. And then we drew a budget constraint. Oops, not a very that's not a very good one, but we drew a budget constraint where supposedly uh, this very thick chalk that uh, the tangent to the budget constraint is the ops the optimum uh, choice between those two uh, those two goods. And what we're going to do is just use the same apparatus, the same kind of indifference curves and budget constraint to describe two more trade-offs for consumers. The concept of a trade-off if you is embedded in the budget constraint if you buy more, more X than you have to get less Y as long as you stay on your budget constraint. Okay, so let's do a labor-leisure trade-off. So labor-leisure trade-off. Okay, so this would be hours of leisure and this would be your dollar income. So let's say it's a uh, you know out of an an eight hour working day. So if you if you make ten dollars an hour then if you spend uh okay and so we're gonna have an eight hour eight hours total. That's kind of gonna be our budget constraint. So the most income we could get if we spent all eight hours working would be eighty dollars. And the most leisure we could get if we spent zero hours working would be eight hours. So there's eight hours and there's our eighty dollars of leisure. And that's um, so that's our budget constraint. And if we draw a curve, we might end up like this. We might end up saying, well, we'll work three hours or four, three and a half hours or whatever that shows up to be. And for those three hours, we would end, then earn thirty dollars. So work three hours and get thirty dollars of wage income. And that would be the a, a labor leisure uh, choice that we would make. Um, so the <coughs> uh, the effect of a higher wage rate is a bit ambiguous. On the one hand, it makes the cost or the opportunity cost of leisure high. So if uh, Tiger Woods can get a huge amount of money for playing in a golf tournament, uh, that means he's giving up a lot of income if he decides not to play golf. I was going to say to play golf instead of playing golf, because playing golf is your le typical leisure activity, but I guess that's not really uh, the case with Tiger Woods. Okay, so um, on the other hand, if you have a higher wage rate, you have higher income, and higher income usually means you want more leisure. We certainly see that over time. As people have gotten wealthier, the amount of time, the portion of their life they spend working has been going down. So people want more leisure. Another way of putting it is leisure is a superior good. So it's not clear that uh, raising wages will necessarily cause you to work more. So there's a substitution effect. The substitution effect means that wages up means that you want to substitute more 
hours of work. But there's an income effect, which is as your wage rate goes up, your existing work gives you more money, and you'd like to spend some of that money uh, basically on being able to work less. So uh, wages going up means you want want more leisure. And so uh, it's not clear which effect will dominate. Uh, I think over time, over long periods of time, it's actually the income effect that dominates. As people's uh, wages have gotten higher, they've wanted more leisure. But in any given situation, a higher wage might induce you to work more, especially if it's a uh, a short-term or temporary increase in the wage. You can you, know, you, you get an opportunity to work on a project and make a lot of money in a short period of time, you take it and then you'll take your leisure later. Um, but anyway, that's this uh, the issue of the labor-leisure trade-off. And I want to do one more, maybe I shouldn't do this in today's lecture, but I will, um, and that's present versus consum future consumption. So, present consumption, future consumption. So, or you can think of this as this year or next year. And the budget constraint is based on the interest rate. So if you, um, um, if you give up a dollar's worth of, of consumption Today you can get let's say a dollar ten tomorrow if the interest rate is ten percent. Then if you give up a dollar worth of consumption t this year, you can have a dollar ten next year. So let's say you had a hundred dollars this year, that means you could spend a hundred and ten next year if you decide to consume absolutely, uh, wait a minute, it's the other way around, sorry, give up 110, give up 100. So if you, if you, um, no, I had it right the first time. So if your consumption this year goes to zero, instead of $100, we had 110 next year. Sorry about all this stuff. Let me see if I can erase a bunch of this. Ah, that's better. Okay. Um, so if you were to, get, to consume absolutely zero this year and save it all, then you could go for 110 next year. Conversely, if you consume everything this year, then you have nothing left over uh, for next year. So th that's your trade-off, and uh, it's based on the interest rate. And again, you choose based on your an indifference curve. So you might say, well, I'll save some of my money, but not all of it. Let's say I'll spend 60 this year and save uh, 40 which means with the 10% interest rate I can consume 44 44 next year and that's an, again another illustration of a of the use of these indifference curves budget constraints and trade-offs um, to make a decision in this case the decision to consume now or consume later and I think I'll just leave it at that